These are your fast facts on the pastoral epistles of 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. First, the pastoral epistles do not easily fit with the storyline of Acts or the narrative sections of the other Pauline epistles. The pastoral epistles treat a number of events and travels, such as the visit to Crete, stopovers at Ephesus, Miletus, Troas, Nicopolis, and they also portray Timothy as leading efforts to establish healthy elders in Ephesus and provide a sense of impending doom that doesn't mesh with what we see in Acts 28. For scholars who reject the authenticity of these books, the solution is simple. Reject the details as the fabrications of an overly detailed later writer who was careless in his research. For those who accept the authenticity of these books, another solution presents itself. Interpret these details in line with the claims of the early church, namely that Paul was released from the imprisonment of Acts 28 and proceeded to Spain before once again being imprisoned and killed under the reign of Nero. Some have suggested that this fourth missionary journey would have functioned as follows based on the details from the pastoral epistles. 1. Paul would have been released from prison in Rome around AD 62. From there, perhaps with some intervening time or journeys, he proceeded to Spain. After that, he would have returned to Asia by way of Crete, picking up the thread of Titus 1.5. The next port of call for Asia would logically be Miletus, connecting the reference in 2 Timothy 4.20. 5. We can speculate that Paul may have fulfilled his expected trip to Colossae to check in on Philemon, as indicated in the 22nd verse of the letter to him. 6. More evidently, a trip to Ephesus, as omitted during Paul's return to Jerusalem in the third missionary journey, was in order, according to 1 Timothy 1.3. 7. Across the Aegean, back into Europe, Paul would have made a stop at his beloved Philippian church that cared for him so well. And this desire is certainly mentioned in the epistle to that church in chapter 2, verses 23 to 24, but also the visit to that region is indicated in 1 Timothy 1, 3. 8. While in the Macedonian region, in the port city of Nicopolis to be specific, Paul wrote to Titus according to chapter 3, verse 12 of that book. 9. All of these travels would have easily covered the five to six years prior to another Roman imprisonment in AD 67 or 68, where Paul would have been executed by Nero as attested to by the early church. Second, the pastoral epistles are frequently viewed as deutero-Pauline. In other words, significant scholars within mainline denominations and major non-evangelical schools have, for the past 200 years, taught that these books were not really written by the Apostle Paul, but by a later writer using a pseudonym. The arguments against Pauline authorship are based on vocabulary conflicts, style conflicts, historical conflicts, such as the journeys mentioned before, but also the organization of church structures and perhaps Gnosticism that may not have existed during Paul's lifetime, and theological conflicts. These are supposed conflicts with Paul's teaching in other known Pauline books. All of these challenges are not without explanation. One, vocabulary and style issues, as we've mentioned in some of our other videos, are probably the weakest argument. Given the unique nature of these epistles as personal addresses to ministry-long companions and the variety of scribes and writing assistants throughout Paul's long writing ministry, we should expect a degree of variation here that's more than plausible for a skilled writer and thinker such as Paul. Two, historical conflicts are a little more challenging. As we've noted, the people and places in these letters more easily fit with a fourth missionary journey that follows the book of Acts. In regard to the structure of the churches, it seems to be a stretch to see more involved in these pastoral epistles than we see, say, in the book of Acts. There in Acts, we find elders and deacons and apostles or apostolic representatives functioning at Jerusalem and across the empire. Paul clearly speaks to the same sort of structure in the opening of his Philippian epistle. Yet, the pastoral epistles provide a little more detail on how to discern these roles. But this kind of instruction is to be expected in areas where the church was growing and needed a more detailed plan for appointing new elders. Lastly, the assumption of full-fledged Gnosticism as the issue being addressed in these epistles is a reach. 3. Theological conflicts are perhaps somewhat more challenging. There are ways that these epistles talk about doctrines, such as the doctrine of salvation, that seem a little out of the ordinary for Paul. Some suggest that later in life, Paul was still clarifying and expounding on his earlier teachings on these doctrines. Others suggest that the different theological vocabulary here is not really out of line for Paul, but actually present in some of those other Pauline epistles. 
But beyond merely pushing back against these three categories of claims, we should note positively that the highly personal shape of these letters, in contrast to most pseudepigraphal literature, which tends to be more abstract, impersonal, and mystical, these letters refer to specific persons and places that are known and unknown in the existing Pauline corpus as well as Acts. In short, Given the plausible explanations that exist for all the arguments against Pauline authorship and that the letters themselves have a compelling personal nature, we would do well to place the burden of proof on those who would argue against 2,000 years of Christian tradition that strongly attest to the Pauline authorship of these books. Third, Timothy and Titus played important roles. Paul relied heavily on these two men throughout his travels as recorded in the book of Acts. Here, Paul is providing these men with important instructions on how they must build up leaders in the churches of Crete and Ephesus while he's unable to carry out the work there himself. Some may see this role as a continual role, providing grounds for an Episcopal model of the church government, where bishops are tasked with overseeing elders in a particular locale. Others may see this role as a time-bound one, providing simply an extension of Paul's unique apostolic ministry during the first century. Still others may see this role as continual but less formal, implying the need for new churches to be provided with the counsel and oversight of fellow elders and other churches in the same locale. Fourth, the pastoral epistles provide the qualifications for pastors. Were it not for these letters, we would not have a clear idea of what the norm should be for the pastors of churches. These qualifications include above reproach, a one-woman man, stewarding his household, not arrogant, gentle, not controlled by alcohol, peaceful, not greedy, hospitable, loving the good, self-controlled, upright and holy, able to teach, and mature. Fifth, the pastoral epistles teach the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture. Two important passages in this regard are 2 Timothy 3, 16-17 and Titus 1, 2. 2 Timothy teaches that all, the totality of, Scripture, the Old Testament from Paul's perspective, but by extension the New Testament as well, is breathed out by God. The idea that God is exhaling the text of Scripture. Then Titus 1, 2 adds another feature to our understanding of that outcome. God cannot lie. Therefore, what he says when he breathes out scripture must be truthful. By tying these threads together, we see, one, the plenary or complete inspiration of scripture. There is an evenness of inspiration, not just particular books or sections of scripture that are less inspired or more inspired than others. Two, the mode of inspiration. God is actively involved in the human writing of scripture. The exact nature of that role is not clearly defined. Three, the connection between inspiration and inerrancy. To affirm that scripture is God speaking is to affirm that the byproduct is truthful scripture. Four, the authority of scripture. Scripture isn't just to be copied or possessed or even read. It is meant to be profitable in the life and ministry of the church. Sixth, does Paul have a positive or negative view of the law? In 1 Timothy 1, 8-11, Paul speaks of the law as good. But this would seem to contradict his sentiment in other epistles, including the sense where the law is something negative, perhaps to be free from due to the work of Christ. But perhaps the answer is found immediately within the text of 1 Timothy. In verse 8, Paul says that the law is only good if one uses it properly. The proper use of the law is not as a means for salvation, but as a means for showing the unrighteous their need for salvation. Seventh, does Paul speak negatively about women? In 1 Timothy 2, 11-12, Paul makes a fairly strong assertion about women in the church. There have been tendencies with this passage on two hands. One, to read more into the text than is warranted. And two, to read less into this text than is warranted. Let's tackle both of these. Regarding reading more into the text, some would say that this passage implies that women should have no role in the public worship of the church and should never speak in front of a mixed gathering. Some would go so far as to limit women from reading scripture, singing, or even public teaching of other women. We should note some cautions for this approach. 1. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul indicates that women may play a role in public prayer and prophetic ministry of the church within the proper bounds of decorum. So we should note that whatever Paul is saying here, he probably isn't as absolute as some would infer here. 2. In Titus 2.3, Paul indicates that older women should, at the very least, have a teaching role with younger women. So we should note that whatever Paul is saying here, he isn't ruling out the idea that women can and should teach. 3. In the book of Acts and elsewhere in the epistles, we do see that Paul trusts women with important roles in the life of the church. 
4. The word translated assume authority over in this passage is one of those words that is used once in the New Testament and has overtones of asserting dominance or control. Now, on the other hand, we mentioned that there are others that would read this text as minimally as possible. These interpreters would suggest that perhaps Paul is stating a personal opinion or something that's limited exclusively to the Ephesian context. Several points that should be observed here. One, as we described in our video in the Corinthian epistles, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35 contains a very similar parallel to our passage here. So for us to try to limit this issue that Paul's addressing to Ephesus seems like a difficult task. Apparently, the problem was widespread enough for Paul to address it both in Ephesus and in Corinth. It seems then naive to assume that the problem that Paul addressed in these two locales would now no longer be an issue in the church today. Two, Paul's use of the first person pronoun I appears throughout this chapter. It seems unwarranted to dispense with this inspired apostolic instruction for this reason alone. In order to do so, we would have to dispense with other personal urgings in this passage, such as a plea for prayer for governmental authorities in verses 1 and 2. This approach introduces more problems than solutions for the evangelical interpreter of Scripture. 3. Paul's use of the direct argument from creation, as opposed to the indirect argument from creation found in 1 Corinthians 11, suggests that whatever Paul is addressing here is not something that can be easily dismissed due to geography or Paul's personal hang-ups. So, what might a balanced approach to this passage be that avoids the pitfalls on both sides, reading too much or too little into the passage? It clearly means something. Here's my attempt to thread the needle. 1. Paul is particularly addressing a kind of authoritative teaching and decision-making around doctrine that would have been definitive for a local congregation. As we mentioned in our video in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul speaks to women remaining silent during the evaluation of prophecies. Paul seems to be likely addressing something similar here. Paul sees women playing certain roles in speaking and even prophesying, but ultimate testing and decision-making on doctrinal matters is on the backs of male elders and overseers. Two, we should anticipate a strong line on matters of doctrine and evaluation of prophecy in an era prior to the close of the canon. This is not to say that the command was limited exclusively to this era, but it could open the door to some breadth in applying this passage in the eras following, when the Bible as our rule of faith and practice had been written and affirmed by the whole church. 3. We should still see this passage as affirming the important role of men to counter the passive role of Adam during the fall of humanity in the garden and take responsibility for preserving pure doctrine in the local church. Passivity of men on these matters carries grave consequences in the church as it did in the garden. In short, this passage has enduring relevance for today's church, but the application is more targeted to the juridical authority behind the development and definition of the church's doctrine. Eighth, what does it mean to be saved through childbearing? 1 Timothy 2 contains yet another challenging verse here in verse 15. Here the implication is that bearing children is in some sense salvific, countering Paul's assertion that faith alone saves. So what do we make of this verse? There are a number of possibilities here. One, an ancient view of this verse would claim that a specific childbirth was in mind. Although Eve took control and Adam relinquished his responsibility, plunging the world into sin, that same woman and her ancestors will be saved by the childbearing, the bearing of the Messiah. The strength of this argument lies in the fact that nearly every other instance of the use of Adam in the New Testament relies on a parallel reference to Christ. The use of the definite article before the word childbearing implies that a specific childbirth could be in mind. Two, a recent view has taken a more natural view of the verse. The NASB renders the word for saved as preserved, reinforcing the idea that Christian women would be protected throughout the process of childbirth. Three, another view has arisen that sees salvation here as referring to the bigger picture of salvation, particularly the sanctification and perseverance of the believer in the faith. This view would see women showing the genuineness of their faith through their faithfulness in childbearing, a symbol for the entirety of their maternal work. Four, still another view sees salvation here in terms of the salvation from deception rather than salvation from sin. This view holds that when women elevate their care for children in a way that exhibits faith, love, holiness, and propriety, they will escape the deception of their first mother. All of these possibilities are worthy of consideration, but they all have their challenges to overcome. Ninth, what is meant by God being the Savior of all people, especially those who believe? 
There are three basic schools of thought in how they approach this passage. One is universalism. Here they would see that God actually saves all people from final damnation, but particularly those who believe get the full experience of the full force of that salvation. Second, those who believe in unlimited atonement would say that God, through the work of Christ, offers salvation to all of humanity, but only those who believe will receive that salvation. Third, those who believe in limited atonement would say that God, through the work of Christ, is the exclusive means by which humanity can find salvation, but only those who believe will receive that salvation. In summary, view one should be rejected as contrary to the whole of Scripture. Views two and three are plausible interpretations of the verse, with view two placing the emphasis on all people, and view three placing the emphasis on the Savior. Tenth, does Paul encourage the use of alcohol? In 1 Timothy 5.23, Paul encourages Timothy to use alcohol to help his physical health. On the one hand, this passage does not necessarily support the recreational use of alcohol, but rather the medicinal use of it. But on the other hand, it should be noted that Timothy is likely abstaining entirely from any use of alcohol in order to avoid any appearance of excess in that area. Paul is thus pressing on Timothy's conscience in this area and letting him know that total abstinence is not necessary as he avoids drunkenness. See 1 Timothy 3.3. 3. In short, this passage demonstrates a balanced understanding of alcohol in the life of a minister of the gospel. And those are your fast facts on the pastoral epistles of 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. Thank you.